Cool. Okay, I hit continue, right? Yep. Good. Hi, Heather. Oh, hi. Uh, to get started, do you just want to say your name and where you are? I'm Michael Clemens, and I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and the first question that we have is, who are you? Uh, who are you as a person, as a human being? Your passions, your qualities, your values, whatever you'd like to say about that. Well, I think, first of all, I'm a father, and now a grandfather, which feels like the most important thing I've ever been involved in. Um, and uh, I appreciate that over the years, and even more now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I also think that I'm a... Excuse my coughing. I like the uh, word passion. I see myself as a very passionate, embodied person. Uh, actually, all of my life, I was an athlete all my life and uh, um, involved in sports and physicality. And the way I understood myself as a child was through very much my senses. Um, and um, I'm somebody who grew up in an area <coughs> which people think about as the Pennsylvania Dutch country where the Amish and Mennonite live. And I grew up around a lot of farming and a lot of nature. I lived in these housing, this housing plant literally right on the edge of all of this. And um, I'm somebody who feels most connected when I can smell the land and feel the land. And most of my professional life, I pursued places where I go where I, and I can touch the land and smell the land. And, um, um, I'm <clears throat> by birth, Irish Catholic and German, some Dutch. And I grew up in a very small family, just my sister and myself and my parents. Um, my father was a lawyer, so I grew up somewhat privileged in terms of opportunities, <coughs> but also then at a certain point of our life, he became very ill and all of that fell away. And um, I had to hustle a lot to get into college and so, uh, I'm somebody who's known a lot of support and then absolute sense of the floor dropping out from underneath me. Uh, I also grew up the first of, mm, seven, eight years of my life in an all Jewish neighborhood. I was the only Goy child, only Goy and boy. And uh, a number of the people had survived the Holocaust. So, um, I didn't understand that as a child. And I do remember seeing people with tattoos and numbers on their wrist. Um, but what I knew is how loved and welcome I felt there. And um, um, I had a lot of what are called boobies, uh, older Jewish women and, you know, having me in for cake and talking to me. And um, I was just left with this sense of warmth and kind of a love of people. And I think that's partly who I am. I think back about that just, um, and realize that when we moved to the suburbs, even though we got closer to the land I loved, I missed being in that apartment complex with all those wonderful folks. Uh, and when my friend Tali Levine brought me, uh, actually my, a couple of people brought me to Israel. She brought me one time. As soon as I got there, politics aside, what I was most comfortable with was sitting in that same culture. Um, um, so um, guess what else I want to say about myself? Um, <clears throat> my passion 
obviously for people who know me is my work, but even as much deeply as the arts, um, I spent the entire day today listening to um, jazz and listening to music, which I grew up on with my parents, and literature, uh, my other passion, uh, literature and, and uh, some people call it the cinema. <clears throat> and that, that uh, was the first part of my life until I stumbled into Gestalt. Um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, I think for the moment, that's what I want to say. I, I also think that I'm very deeply interested in connecting to animals. The, the four-legged flying other creatures uh, um, and uh, particularly influenced with shamanism and <clears throat> early approaches, indigenous approaches to the meaning of life through that relationship. I sometimes get bored listening to people. I'm much more <laughs> in dogs sometimes. Uh, uh, yeah. So my fondest memories have been in places, particularly Big Sur and some other places, the Highlands in Scotland, places where I uh, just really connected with <clears throat> those relationships. Um, yeah. Huh. <laughs> Well, that's fair. Um, one of the other questions that we have is who out of the people in your story would you say has been one of the people who has impacted you the most? Who has shaped who you are in some way? I get to pick one? Well, you can pick a couple, but... Okay, there's a couple people, but not, not lengthy. Um, well, I mean, it's it's who and how, not just. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was a child, as we grew up in these apartments, my parents got connected to this young African American woman who was in high school, um, who was interested in business. Her name was Dorothy, and Dorothy was my babysitter. In reality, Dorothy was the only person I trusted. I was a uh, wildly imaginative kid and uh, my parents would just laugh, but sometimes I was afraid of things. And uh, I remember being afraid of this television show called Ramar with the jungle. These animals would come out and I would run and hide in my room. And, and uh, But then I run back to watch it. But I remember my relationship with Dorothy because she was very cool and sophisticated. And she went on to be a huge manager and a vice president or president of engineering firm. Um, Dorothy would say, come here. And she would hold me in her lap, but not confine me. And she would just like breathe. And um, I had this sense of um, just breathe, like it'll pass, it's okay. Um, and um, I think when we moved, I began to get a little too old for that kind of a babysitter. When we moved, uh, I forgot about being a little boy as we often do, you know, th those moments. Um, I remember I met somebody years later and uh, when I was working in addiction treatment and she reminded me of Dorothy. And I suddenly, I loved her and I couldn't understand why I liked her so much. But about that time, my mother told me that she went to some business meeting where she was and Dorothy gave an address for the company. 500,000 people. And my mother went up to her and she remembered who I was uh, or who she was. And the first thing she said was, well, how's Michael? And I started to cry. It was, there's something about a primal connection in our tissue and 
it was, I mean, this was her job. And yet it was so much more than that. And it was so much more than race. It was about uh, somebody very solid in my life. And uh, who was just kind of at times amused by me. It didn't, it was like, well, that's interesting. You're gonna throw all these things out the window. Sort of like you are with your son. It's kind of like, well. Uh, <clears throat> and um, what I got from her was to trust my instincts, <clears throat> to trust myself. Um, I'm probably the most significant version of letting someone support me. Uh, so Dorothy for sure. And uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, <clears throat> lived in a highly dysfunctional family, alcoholic family, a lot of mental health problems, a lot of abuse thing that was behind the circ. And I was completely lost. And uh, I found my first love, which is not a woman or a man, but was basketball. And uh, my basketball coach was the guy I wanted to be, Lloyd. And uh, um, what he gave me was sort of how to dress as a man, how to be classy, how to respect people. Um, um, and um, I didn't have it anywhere else. Um, and I, I remember I went to college and I did really well after doing very poorly in high school because I was not interested. And I came back and I had made the Dean's list and I was so excited and I said, I think I'm gonna transfer. And he said, well, he used to call me Hawk. He said, Hawk, I think you're doing okay. You know, maybe you just wanna hang. It was the best advice I ever got. Um, and he, um, he really in, in, encouraged me in another way, but I also looked up to the way he was uh, with all people with diversity. He was just um, just so open and so, and he was cool. He was just a cool guy. Um, um, so those are the two that I think about being a, as a kid. There is someone from Gestalt um, and her name was uh, Renette Eden Fonts. We used to call her Rennie. And she was on the faculty. Rennie was severely uh, impacted by um, arthritis. She had a plastic knee, a pa pla plastic elbow, plastic wrist. She was walked like this and um, had been a former musical theater and ballet dancer. And um, she was the best therapist I've ever seen really makes Fritz's tapes look kind of average. Um, she was elegant and uh, I watched her work and, uh, you know, and I watched her write and she would write down everything she heard everyone say with this withered hand. Uh, and what I got from her because of what I went through with my father was, oh, you know, uh, we can, I can, we can live and prosper no matter what's going on with us. Um, and um, at, towards the end of her life, she got worse and I was brought on the faculty in Cleveland. And I was like the trainee assistant, the new faculty. So my job was to help Rennie get her car started. I scraped the ice off of it and everything. And, um, I loved it. It was great. And she would tell me stories about her and Fritz and uh, um, the quality of the woman and the way she embraced the work we do, how she embodied it was remarkable. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I just wish a lot of people knew about her. You know, Arch Roberts wrote that book about her, collected her works and you know, I know Arch, Gordon, and myself were profoundly influenced by this little lady who had her henna hair um, and was as graceful as anyone I ever knew. I should be so grateful.
is the way I feel. Yeah. So those are the folks. Yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe some of them you've already touched on, but the, the next question would be what event or circumstances would you say have really shaped who you are? Uh, obviously my childhood and the chaos. Um, I learned to survive no matter what. And um, it took me a long time to overcome the kind of punky way that I did survive. But I, um, that um, Vietnam and everything that happened uh, with all of us. Um, I was part of the anti-war movement. Oh, just kind of catapulted pulled me into a different culture, into a counterculture. And I met some of the most amazing people. Uh, I was thinking today about doing this. And I was in Boston in a place with some people kind of going to quote party up in Boston with a bunch of Boston College, Harvardy people, and was shy, and it was at this uh, party, and I did the thing people do in those days as I started to look at their record collection, which gave me something to do. It's, it's really classic shy boy. This guy came over in an army jacket. It was an African American guy. Uh, I think it was his name. <coughs> I don't want to say his name because of what I'm going to say. And he was running away from the draft. And his brother uh, had died in Vietnam. <clears throat> we spent about an hour talking about, first we started looking at John Coltrane, all the things and how much we liked it. And then we started talking about what was going on. And I remember um, feeling like this bond we had and the difference between us. And he didn't get into college, so he had to go to the army. And yet, we were like within a year of each other. And, and uh, I think that whole thing is an epitome, <coughs> including some of these large demonstrations and made me feel like I had some impact, but it also made me feel like I was part of something deeply. And the whole counterculture movement, what people call hippies, or the uh, first time I, I started hanging out with people and they would literally invite me to their house to have an eggplant and would sit there and the women would sew and like, um, talk about macrobiotics and about raising children. And I felt like I was home. And I think that whole thing um, set me up for Gestalt. So I was in somebody's house and I was in an altered state and I couldn't sleep. And they had all these books <coughs> in their house. I was like, thousands of books, these bookshelves. And I stumbled on this book called The Counterfeit Infinity, or not, it's called uh, mm, The Making of a Counterculture by Theodore Razak. And somehow I opened to this chapter about Paul Goodman. And I read, I was like 21 years old. That I didn't suggest in my school, they didn't suggest it as reading. I started reading this and I thought, this is amazing. Who is this guy? Uh, maybe I was 22. And I, uh, I, I was blown away and I was high. Um, so I put the book back. <coughs> I didn't steal it. Uh, I put the book back and about <coughs> three or four years later, I'd gone through treatment for alcohol and drug addiction and was hired as a, like a junior caseworker there. And I had a supervisor 
And I went into her room and she was trying to tell me how to do this training shop. And on the shelf was Pearl's Heaven Lining Goodman, Ego Hunger and Aggression, and this book. And I was staring at the book and she said, do you want to borrow that? I said, sure, yeah. And I went up and that was, I devoured it. <coughs> Came back for the other book. And then there was a book called Creative Processing Gestalt Therapy. And um, written by Joseph, who became my therapist and trainer uh, years later. But I think those events, like the people I was with, were so amazingly lucid and connected to the whole movement that those events showed me that there was a different way to live than the way that I was living, that the way even my family lived. Um, more socially conscious, more relational. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I just think about that. It was in Bennington, Vermont, the day that I saw that book. Um, um, so it feels like my life has been these droplets of things of consciousness, karmically, that have gotten dropped. And then I end up, oh, there that is again. There that is again, yeah. Um, I really wish I had met Paul Goodman. Um, uh, since it was such, such a large influence. Um, more than Fritz. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. Yeah. So what would you say that you were most attracted to uh, in Gestalt? Laura. The... <laughs> <laughs> no, not physically. <laughs> Although I, I liked her style. Um, I, for me, it was about embodiment and about the phenomenal moment. Because the rehab where I went, every, we, that's what we did was gestalt, experiential, experiential. And I, I, we did it and I worked in it for two or three years before I was ever trained. Um, the notion of um, the present moment and the holistic coherency of ourself in relation was uh, made total sense to me. Partly because I saw it lived out in the therapeutic community I, li I lived and worked in. <coughs> and uh, it was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, I was trained by um, Sonia, um, um, Elaine Kepner, Joseph, Edwin, Rennie, um, just some remarkable people, and uh, Isabel Fredrickson, and, and um, at the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland, this is the original generation. And then, then Isidore, who kind of felt like a strong cup of coffee. I, I liked him, my class was terrified of him. Uh, particularly, he understood alcoholism, deeply so. He even talked to me about it. It was amazing to talk to him. Um, I should be so sharp in my life. But when I saw Laura work and the way she worked and the, how clean she was and how um, body oriented and how much there was support there without being gooey that, um, I kind of decided that's what I want to do when I grow up. Uh, it was watching her work uh, with other people and um, um, it was like watching one of those um, Zen paintings with the, just a few brush strokes. Um, yeah, it was, it was really quite amazing. And then, and then, so then I went and did the training in Cleveland, off and on for three to five years, different things. And, um, and it was in that time that I'm, uh, well, I, that's how I met Laura. And then eventually was asked to join the faculty. Uh, she came here to so, Pittsburgh a number of times. 
Yeah. So then what did you do with all of that? Like, what has your involvement been? What have uh, you done with this? What have you brought to it? Where have you taken it? Huh. Somewhere, I think. Uh, uh, <laughs> what I've done with that is the one thing as I did is I need more education. And I went back to graduate school and went to Duquesne and studied phenomenological psychology with a guy named, uh, one of the people was Amadeo Giorgi, who's amazing. Um, um, and they helped me learn how to think and articulate myself. I mean, I had a felt sense, but I didn't know how quite to articulate. Uh, and then I got my PhD. Um, um, what I've done with it initially is, I just saw thousands of clients. Um, <clears throat> with very good experience and uh, training and supervision. And that's what I think works. <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots of clients. And, uh, um, and uh, cause I wanted to make a difference in the world, a la Goodman. But, but I also, I think the thing that characterizes me is I really like people. I'm like all the fiction and I'm interested in the story of people. Um, I don't think what I've written has ever captured how I work, which is my one regret. Um, uh, ah, but I, I, I think what I've done is bring that kind of physical, mensch quality about me to the work um and um and um got the opportunity after doing that to teach in cleveland and then I, it was um a guy named ian greenberg from england who invited me to come to teach in metanoia and then gordon wheeler invited me to come to uh Esalen to teach and then I became sort of like a rock and roll band for about two decades. Um, I have the privilege of teaching at all these wonderful institutes and getting to meet so many people and seeing all the different ways to do Gestalt. So I think what I've done is I've soaked up a lot. You know, I, I wrote this email to Peter Philipson. I said, I, I really want to quote you about this phrase you used. And he said, I love the phrase, Michael, but I didn't say that. I think you did. Uh, and I think, oh uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's just, it feels almost like the contact boundary of a blending of, for me, that I think that's what I did. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just more privileged, you know, to be able to pay, to get paid to teach somewhere and come to see. And, uh, but also, I think what I did was, and what values me is students. And I've had a lot of health problems lately. And I've been, you know, I've been struggling with cancer. And I've been hearing from those people all over the world. It's amazing. Um, yeah. The one thing I think I have contributed after some of the people from Columbus, uh, Jesse Carlo and some of those people wrote an article on addiction and I kind of, I really started to write about Gestalt and addiction. And in some way I feel like I made some people look at it because they didn't want to look at it, frankly. Um, and some other people just wanted to be invited to do a discussion about it. Uh, and that, that was something I've spent a lot of time with. Um, yeah. Um, hmm. It's hard for me to think about what I've done to blow my horn. I have a terrible time having a website and saying things about myself. Um, I really do. Um, and I think yeah, that- you're I, also horrible about answering emails for self-promotion and things like that. 
I, I, I think um, Richard Kitzler, who I really liked, told me, he said, you're an odd version of an exhibitionist and incredibly shy. He knew me for five minutes. Uh, and I think that's right. The shyness about myself is, um, uh, I don't see it as a defect. I think it's what I was raised in. Um, it was my dad. Um, and um, so it's hard to say, oh, well, you know, I did this and look at my, my, um, Honestly, I think my life speaks for itself in some way. I really do. Um, and um, I feel more fortunate to have worked with people in some way. Um, you know, uh, Phil Joyce, Ruella Frank, um, you know, to meet uh, Margarita, Dewey, Tale, to just lots and lots of people and just um, hang out rolling on the floor in Mexico with Lynn at a, you know, um, um, and just, just to really soak up them. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's what I think is important. I, um, and I feel, I think all of us, for me, I just feel completely changed by those relationships. Um, um, How so? How have you been affected and changed by all of that? Well, let me name one other person, and that's not a Gestaltist. It is Thich Nhat Hanh. Like, um, unlike anybody I ever met. Uh, I think... Uh, <sighs> Peter is another person, I feel truly engaged with uh, and impacted by Dan. Um, I think I have felt pulled out of myself and into the I, we kind of flow. Um, and um, yeah, um, Clearly emotionally. I mean, the people I've mentioned are just, you know, I have touched me. And at this point in my life where I am, I'm very, very moved by that. But also, um, I'll never think about therapy the same way after meeting Lynn. No, I'm just listening. And uh, um, yeah, it just feels like such a a great privilege and just like that I, we have these opportunities to influence each other. Um, um, and Thich Nhat Hanh, um, in times like this with all the riots and the violence, he said that um, what he did when the war was raging in his village is that he would go inside for a moment and close the shades of his eyes consciousness and have a mental cup of tea and breathe in and breathe out and find the sense of flow and peace. Um, and for someone like me who grew up in what I grew up in, um, it's been an enormous comfort. And, you know, um, sometimes it feels like we're chattering monkeys and uh, I can't I can feel like a chattering monkey and blah, blah, blah. And we're, but then it just to go to that place, um, which is what grabbed me about Laura, just like, um, the stillness that you create for, we create for each other. Um, I think that's been the influence of those relationships and, and who I am. Um, because there's a million thoughts and ideas and things, of course. Um, and moving beyond myself, clearly, I think that's, you know, from Lynn and Gordon, very much so. Um, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. I miss, I miss Korea. I miss Mexico. I miss, uh, all the wild and woolly people in London and, uh, uh, you know, elsewhere. And, uh, you know, it just feels like I'm a citizen of the world. That's what I got. Um, and for an American, that's incredibly important. You know, for me as an American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. So this, this question almost feels a little bit out of sequence, but I'll throw it in here and see what He's happens. Good, by the, you're good. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, <laughs> I learned from some good people. Um, how would you say, or what would you say to your experience of yourself as a man or your gender, either through Gestalt, in Gestalt, because of, around, whatever? What was the last part of it? Just, I, it's not necessarily like, how do you walk into a Gestalt space as a man? But is there any kind of relationship or is it, maybe it has nothing to do with Gestalt? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how do you experience yourself as a man or your gender? As a man, complicated. It's complicated. I feel complicated. Um, I've had some amazing models. My father was just sat in creative indifference so beautifully. Uh, he really was. He was just such a, he was such a warm man. His best friend in law school was an African-American and my parents' best friends was a lesbian couple and they play bridge with in Philadelphia. And, um, I grew up in a house of queer is part of the world. Queer is part of what is. Uh, and um, um, to be attentive to, I can't think of myself as a man without thinking of myself as a white man. I think about you know, just not only the privileges I have, but just I was writing something about how I got I got pulled over. I was racing home from Cleveland for some reason. To, I was teaching to get to my apartment so I could crash, and I and I kind of did a turn through a yellow reddish light. Of course, no one was there. I, no one was on the street, and bam, I got stopped. I got stopped by a cop and. She looked at my license and where I lived and she said, okay, go ahead, I'm gonna give you a warning. And I thought, all right, so I'm a white man and I'm a professional. If I was a young African-American man, I wouldn't have got that walk. And so when I walk into a room, I'm very aware of the assumptions and inherent part of the ground of entitlement and um, um, the legacy of what uh, men have done and do. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, somebody once told me, you're so male. And then some shamanic guy said to me, God, you're so female. Um, what I forgot to say in those situations is, what does that mean? I just took it up as like, well, like, you know, um, but um, I think how my, how I take up space as a male, um, how I make space for others, hold space for others, um, and um, both not to de not to um, dilute myself, because I've tried that, and a lot of people do that. It's insulting to people. Uh, I had an African American colleague who was in organizational uh, development. We we ran a group together. She said, "Don't do that shit. You're not helping anybody." And I thought, okay, not dilute myself. 
I'd also be really aware of wanting to enhance the power of others and the kind of sense of authenticity with others. In the last eight to 10 years, I've really been influenced as a man around gender, about the whole queer continuum and the whole LGBTQT. There's a lot of people I'm close to. There's a lot of people I have students. And I just, um, I really want to pay attention to all the inherent embedded assumptions of me. You know, I can pound my chest and say things at conferences or things like I believe this, but in the moment, um, there's, there's, there's something that uh, about, for me, about paying attention to, uh, what is that line is, uh, perception is perspectival. So I perceive from the perspective of my own engendered world and my own engendered history. And I feel as if that the discipline is to pay attention to that. Um, and I learned that lesson again and again. Um, props to Mark Fairfield and a lot of people who uh, um, have just really woken me up to the assumptions. Like, it's not enough to me for me to be a kind, decent guy who's a therapist and really care, but to be aware of how I organize the world according to how I've grown up and what I believe, what I believe male is. Uh, that's blissfully gotten blown up. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, and I'm not like all sorted and I got the categories constant. Um, you can see the smile on my face. I can feel pain, embarrassment, and shame. I'm also really excited about this experience. What I got in Gestalt is, well, maybe things aren't the way you think they are. Let's look again. Um, and uh, I, I just, you know, I, uh, that's what I pay attention to. As well as the fact that I'm an older man now. And it, there's a different energy about how I am now and the field I co-create, the, you know, the atmosphere, as Johnny would say, was of, that, of being an older man versus when I was 35 and 40. Uh, took me a while to realize I was an older man. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so. I think okay. that's what, what I pay attention to. Uh, and uh, yeah. Well, this, this next question is um, whether this concept of a Gestalt community means anything to you. Do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? Absolutely. You know, um, well, let me, you don't know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I listen to people, I read people, read to people. I uh, so, um, I mean, I carry people in me even when I'm not with them. Um, the other day, as I've gone through a lot of struggle, I had this lovely Skype conversation with Lynn, Leanne, <coughs> Leanne O'Shea. And, you know, we were reaching from Pittsburgh to Melbourne. And it felt like I'm part of the thread. Yeah. I don't stay as current sometimes lately with some of the struggles I've had with my health. Um, um, uh, but, I, you know, I do carry that in me all the time. And, you know, I think about people and <clears throat> uh, watching what people do and uh, my students and just other people. And I was very impacted by Bud's death because I got to know him and hang with him and Mexico and other places. And uh, yeah, it felt like that. Not to be cliche, but like there's a disturbance in the force. 
and it feels like something of a thread or a matrix that we are just got disrupted for me and um, um, I do um, honestly to not be critical but in that kind of trashing way um, sometimes some of the ways that people are presenting a thing and when we get dogmatic as if this is like the Torah uh, bores me to death. Um, I'm just not interested. Uh, partly because I grew up, I had 18 years of Catholic school. I had catechism and religion and theology again and again and again. And uh, uh, there's a lot more that's not in the book. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, I, um, I feel part of the community. I literally come, I was feel like I was born by the community. Um, I grew up in Gestalt. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking about Elaine Kepner, who was my mentor, one of my two mentors, and uh, who just said basically to me, you're mine. And I was like, oh, okay. <clears throat> and uh, told me about people and introduced me to people. And uh, yeah, um, I wish I had more time to keep up with some of what people are doing. You know, um, you know, some of my students like Perry McIntosh, John Gillespie, just um, Helena Callender, just like doing great stuff. And, I miss not being able to see them and see what they do as much. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, <coughs> I think I'm part of Gestalt phenomenology. Uh, that's what I think we'd put on my tombstone and you know, those were my parents. Um, uh, uh, yeah. I never feel like I have gestalt right. I'm sure there's other people who can say it better than me and know it better than me. So <clears throat> I think that's more an old, old thing with me. I don't think it's really about gestalt. But, uh, I'm back for more. <sighs> does that make sense? It yeah. does. It is slippery yeah. though. It's really slippery. What? And I think it would be really arrogant for anyone to actually say that they do have it, so. Yeah. Malcolm yeah. said the same thing to me. I was like, okay, yeah. Well, it's, it's good to know. It's good to not know, I guess. Well, I think if I know, my curiosity stops. And if I'm not curious, then I'm actually not being in a gestalt way. Um, yeah. Got it. I got it. Yeah. Um, nope. Now it's gone again. <laughs> what? What? No, it's gone again. Gone yeah. Again. Nope. <laughs> like, yeah. Sure. You know that that notion of, well, what's happening? What is now? What is happening now? Um, mm -hmm. And how do you understand it? How do I see it? Feel it? How do we? Like that's what. That's what excites me. Yeah. Well, that might be part of the answer to this one. Um, it sounds like a bit of a challenge, but the question is what, what would you say your greatest challenge in or around Gestalt has been? Two. One, when I initially came, because I came from the hard knock world of encounter therapy. <clears throat> and God, I thought all the Gestaltists were a little light and weenies uh, because I was used to a lot of screaming and a lot of intensity. <clears throat> and uh, it felt very white to me. 
Because the people I got sober with and then worked with and hung with were a large amount of African-American folks and there was a considerable uh, value of direct expression. And uh, when I came to Gestalt, I loved the theory. And then I just thought, God, these people are all like civilized. And, but it didn't take long to have that cure me of that idea. Uh, but I had a challenge of being patient and uh, slowing myself down and uh, appreciating the smallest, most doable uh, thing. That was initially my challenge. Was, uh, as one of my teachers said, Michael, you're quite ambitious. Uh, true. Um, and I think now, um, trusting that I am Gestalt, that trusting my experience and that um, um, I was once taught by Lane Kepner about uh, unconsciously competent, that notion, you know that notion. And I feel like I'm unconsciously competent. Some people might say I'm quite unconscious, but it's like, I don't think about what I'm doing when I'm doing it. You know, like what resistance is this? What like really? Um, and uh, trusting that and yet at the same time, coming back to like, Bracketing in the more realistic sense of, okay, so what am I making of this? What, how am I constructing this? What, you know, if I can step back a little bit and see um, what I'm doing, what we're doing, how we are, um, that feels like an ongoing challenge for me. That is, I think, our work uh, to me. Uh, and I experience that like six or seven times a day, at least. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay. What's around the corner? What is it I can't see out of my eyes? What's in the ground or peripheral? Uh, how is the other? What is it about the other that I'm not including or attending to or somehow, you know, being with? Not in a critical way, but just like curious. Um, and that just feels like a, like a lovely challenge. A lovely challenge. Mm -hmm. Never got it right yet. Keep trying. Keep coming back. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, another one of the questions is, and some people take this uh, as a sort of a storytelling moment and some don't have a, a, an answer for it, but what would you say has been one of your greatest memories or your greatest moments? In my whole life? Within, no, within Gestalt, <laughs> or it could be in your whole life if you want. Um, client, therapist, trainer, anything. I have two come to mind. One is more as a I work with a guy who was um, strongly addicted to opiates and then Suboxone, which is an alternative and uh, came to me and he was a professional, medical professional and um, was going to lose his license and um, he's going to go to jail and unless he got clean and you know we started to work together and 18 years later he's still clean and um, has a family He's usually moved up in the world of business. He's amazing. And uh, 
wanted to come back for some sessions and uh, um, he started to talk. And as I was sitting with him, I realized what happened between us? What happened between us? What he did and, and, and uh, how he just moved into doing the work and he knew how to pay attention to himself and, uh, um, and the amazing change process that has come up for him. Um, and to me, that was, this sense of, yeah, yeah, this works. And I, at one point he said something and I said, I think we did well. And then he said to me, we're not done, which was cool. Um, I very, very touched. Um, and ironically, he said to me, well, as I'm talking, I just wonder what's happening with you. And I thought, well, I've trained this guy well. You know, he wasn't just like using me as a confessional. He was like, where are you? Um, um, the other time was, uh, I was sitting in a conference with Rolla Frank on one side and Irv on the other side, watching Gary Yontef do this piece of work, which was really nice. It was really nice. And uh, he finished, it was so moving. And uh, speaking of male energy that, I, that has value, it just was great. And uh, um, he came over and I think Ruella and I both immediately said something like, the way you used your body. And he said, well, I, I didn't really notice that. And Irv laughed and everybody walked away and I thought, yeah, yeah there's something about um, generations and um, people uh, being humble, uh, but so curious in the midst of doing magnificent work. And um, I, I carried that with me for a long time. I still do, obviously. I think about that moment. Um, and I think about um, the woman he worked with and uh, the way he was and, uh, and who we are, who we are, who, what we do, our value, the values we have is gestalt that we carry about humanity. And um, um, yeah, it reminds me a lot of the co-founder of Esalen who I never got to meet but as soon, every time I was there, and I've been there like 50 times, everybody said, you should have met Dick. You and Dick, Dick Price, and everything I read, it reminds me of the qualities and the videotapes I've seen of Dick. That absolute interest in the other and how the other is in the world. Um, and I think at that moment, at that conference, I could feel like it was something we shared. Oh, yeah. Because some of these days we work and some of the people we work, it is the dark night of the soul. At least it's hard and painful. And I think back, you know, and connect to that kind of connection of, so, yeah. So there, there is something that connects to us and, um, just how amazing what we do really is. And I and we, I think, forget it. In the moment, and it's like, we don't glorify, but we just, it gets some days really hard to realize what wonderful change agents we are with the people we work with. Yeah, so that's the memories. Hmm. Well, then the next part of that, and this is actually the last thing that I would ask, is what's next? I mean, hearing, hearing what you've said, hearing where you are, I get that it's a weird question. Um, but what do you want to do with Gestalt and where do you think it's going? Oh, those are two questions. They are two. Yeah. Okay. It's two for one. You're lucky today. Yeah. Well, I just like, I was starting to answer one and then you said the other. <laughs> uh, like the ever ready bunny, I went to both. Um, 
I want to continue focusing what interests me is um, our bodies in relation and how we create the world through our bodies. That is my interest. Um, and um, um, back to having a really difficult period of health and sort of in the midst of it, I've been regenerated to write. Every time I finished writing, I thought I'll never do that again. Never. Uh, au contraire. Um, I'm starting to do a bunch of research and writing on taking Gestalt to look at uh, illness, disability, the sense of othering, and the phenomenal, ex phenomenological experience of, of illness, what we would call illness, our bodies changing and getting older, death, um, and having come from a family where, you know, my father was disabled and in a wheelchair about um, what that experience is like and how we treat people. Um, um, and part of it has to do with, I want to take Gestalt to really take a good shake and look at this notion of ascendancy and everything can be fixed and everything can be, uh, I know people don't believe it and I can imagine there's some people saying, well, that's not what we believe, but that's sometimes how we act, um, you know, and really come back to what uh, Besser said, what about, you know, um, um, Staying with what is, and what is, is uh, this. Uh, what is, is um, in this COVID time, is uh, the notion of what it is to be ill. I've spent a lot of time in cancer treatment places, and it's a different world, and people treat you differently. And uh, there's millions of people who have that experience physically. and. I'm so interested in having you know, explore that and how we how we honestly work and can pay attention to how we feel and what we do with that in the way that diversity people have taught us to pay attention to around race around uh, gender identity this is feels a little bit like a last frontier and uh, so that's what I'm writing about and interested in it and uh, um, yeah, it just feels that's where I'm, that's what I'm interested in now. Uh, as far as Gestalt, uh, I want us to be less provincial and less pleased with ourselves, really. Um, um, and uh, I don't think we need to endlessly celebrate how great Gestalt and as it works and, you know, how we can prove ourselves and the our work speaks for itself. And I really do think we need to videotape a lot more. You know, um, hopefully there's a lot of Lynn and, you know, other people because my trainers, which are some of those amazing people I mentioned, were not vid videotaped and it wasn't saved for posterity. Um, that is unconscionable unconscionable um the one guy you introduced me to from mexico city uh, miguel i think is watching him work i was like i wish this was videotaped uh, my friend Arie burstein he's brilliant watching him work um we need to do more to hold that and um and uh have that for all of us and i think your work some of the work you're doing with with uh, the virtual media and stuff is a way to do that um, because um, time slips away and uh, people slip away and uh, uh, you know it would be just great to have that that's where i'd leave to see us go as well as open up to what's outside of gestalt rather than consider it paradigm paradigmatic and uh, talmudic um, because our founders were very much influenced by a whole lot of other stuff. And I think we need to be more around groups and diversity.
Um, I, I really do. Um, the way we've done things is not the way we should always do things. Um, so that's where that's what I hope for for Gestalt, and um, then I hope to be around to see a lot more of it. That would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's do that. Um, thank you. I think this is it, isn't it? Unless there's anything you'd like to add, yes. Except for my thank you. Thank you very much. Um, No, I just feel like um, I've said a lot and I said a lot about who I am. Um, and um, I really do appreciate the work you and people like Madeleine and people have done. It's like getting things out and people to see. Um, and um, let's keep doing it. Yeah. Gracias. Thanks.